Hello, good evening. It is now 5 p.m. and we are now um, out of recess and resuming our hearings on the budget. And we have back with us the Baltimore City Information Technology Department. And we're going to be uh, discussing broadband and digital equity and then also the chief data officer. So um, the representatives that are here for this session, I uh, make sure you um, introduce yourself and we'll start now. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jason Hardebeck. I'm the director of the mayor's office of broadband and digital equity. And with your permission, I'd like to open with a few comments. I, we have a single slide, so this should go pretty fast. Yes, of course. Thank you, ma'am. So the Office of Broadband and Digital Equity was established just over a year ago. Since then, we have worked to develop a deliberate, thoughtful, and sustainable approach to addressing digital equity in Baltimore. The digital equity framework lays out the foundation for this approach, starting with the assertion that broadband access has become table stakes for modern civil society and is simply too important to continue to depend on private companies and market forces alone to close the digital divide. Mayor Scott has declared this access to be critical public infrastructure, just as decades ago, cities made similar decisions about clean drinking water and paved public roads. The $35 million commitment in ARPA funds represents a first step, a down payment, if you will, towards permanent closure of the digital divide in Baltimore. Phase one of the ARPA commitment, as the Chief Recovery Officer um, discussed yesterday, has enabled our first steps towards this goal, including um, beginning the hiring of key tem team members to build out the office. Talent acquisition is a challenge for everyone these days, but especially in the area of broadband and digital equity with unprecedented funding and clear mandates driving demand. However, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my sincere gratitude to the leadership of a number of agencies that have served as thought partners, comrades in arms, and force multipliers in our shared efforts to close the digital divide. This is by no means a complete list, but I'd like to highlight a special thank you to BCIT, Department of Transportation, Office of Mayor's Office of Performance and Innovation, Baltimore City Recreation and Parks, the Housing Authority, Baltimore City Public Schools, and Pratt Libraries, to name a few. Their active and engaged par partnership has been critical. Also, the development of a citywide fiber to the premise network design, which is a first for a city the size of Baltimore. This design will inform how we build all future city fiber optic projects, including to city buildings, city watch cameras, public Wi-Fi access points, anywhere in the city that needs network connectivity. Those phase one ARPA funds have allowed the work to start to connect all remaining city recreation centers to our existing network. By following this design methodology, we are ensuring that we are building infrastructure that not only supports the specific needs of the rec center, but a multitude of future uses in the surrounding communities as well. All new construction is designed to be as future-proof as we can make it. Design and procurement of an air gap network has commenced. This infrastructure will enable us to deliver service to our public access network which will provide free internet service to designated locations such as our public Wi-Fi system. This network is physically distinct from the city's existing network to eliminate cybersecurity concerns and will give us the flexibility to expand and adapt to new demands in the future. We partnered with BCIT, who by the way did the majority of the heavy lifting, um, to activate our first community partner. Mount Sinai Church in Johnson Square now has city public Wi-Fi to support their community computer training initiatives, and this location will also support Wi-Fi accessible by the neighborhood. Once the air gap network is operational, we will transition this to the public access network. We plan to expand the community partnership model in the future. In addition to city ARPA funding, we were awarded an earmark request for $2.3 million, which is reflected in the FY23 budget. This grant, was, which was championed by Congresspersons Sarbanes and Ruppersberger, will allow this office to partner with 
the health department and Pratt libraries to bring fiber optic cable and internet access to all of our senior centers, both city owned and those run by nonprofit partners, support telehealth pilots in three centers, and support computing devices, internet access, and digital skills training for a thousand older adults in Baltimore. And finally, this summer, in partnership with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City and working with BCIT, we will install the first public Wi-Fi hotspots, starting in Gilmore Homes, which will serve as the basis of a broader deployment throughout West Baltimore and underserved communities throughout the city over the next several years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yes, uh, data, equity, and transparency are also very important to this council and um, welcome in your position. And um, uh, like I said, this is just so very important to us and to the city. And um, you had mentioned uh, uh, senior centers and rec centers, and uh, I know within my district, I can think of one rec center offhand, uh, Tawanda Rec Center, that we basically recently opened and um, just an amazing center. So uh, you have already started to reach uh, many areas that um, have been deprived and neglected for many, many years. So this is another very important piece. And on that note, um, we're going to start with our questioning, and I do want to mention that we have here on, at this session um, Councilwoman Ramos from the 14th dis District, Councilwoman uh, McCray from the 2nd District, uh, Councilmember Conway from the 4th District, and Councilmember um, Dorsey from the 3rd District, and I, Vice President of the Council, and represent the 6th um, district. And we'll start with uh, Councilwoman McCray. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director. Um, I'm going to, I'll start here. Your 2021 digital equity framework stated that you were looking to, was a pretty aggressive timeline of 2030. Um, I'll say ambitious um, timeline of 2030. And one of the keys that, um, that stuck with me was the expanding opportunities for minority participation in procurement, so for some procurement opportunities. Have we had any minority opportunities, any opportunities for minority participation within procurement um, since the framework was published in 2021? I think that was November. Yes, ma'am, that's an excellent question. We have had one procurement actually since the office has been formed, the, the uh, procurement of the air gap network that I had mentioned in my opening comments. Uh, we have um, the, uh, the standard EMBU uh, goals associated with this. We had, uh, this is a professional services agreement, but we had invited three local firms to bid, including uh, a Baltimore City-based minority uh, technology firm. Um, our, which unfortunately were not, was not successful um, in that, um, but our entire effort and the way that we look at this investment, this unprecedented investment in infrastructure, is that it should present opportunities, not just in the physical infrastructure that results, but the, the businesses and the people that build and operate and maintain this equipment. So it is our uh, intention to work very closely with all of our agencies to actually expand the, the supplier database and the supplier base, rather, um, to do more of this work. And as Director Carter and I have talked about on numerous occasions, this is a shared opportunity for the city. I'm very interested in the public Wi-Fi um, spots that you're going to be having. Um, I'm happy to know that they are going to be placed within our senior centers. Um, city senior centers and non-city senior centers as well. Um, what other locations have you identified outside of um, our libraries, our senior, center, our senior centers, and I think you mentioned Gilmore Homes, but what other locations outside of Gilmore Homes have you identified? Yes, ma'am. So we are working with the Mayor's Office of, of Performance and Innovation to develop 
a community engagement plan. So first, it starts with target neighborhoods, target communities, and working with those residents to understand where they want public Wi-Fi. It's easy for us to look at it from a physical infrastructure standpoint and say every park, every transit stop, every public market, you know, community spaces, uh, community garden, et cetera, as potential spots, but it really will require the community's buy-in and engagement. Um, so we, we had announced, uh, the, the mayor announced our initial um, effort would be in a 10 neighborhood, roughly 10 neighborhood blo um, group in West Baltimore, um, kind of centered on San, in Sandtown Winchester. A number of reasons for that. One is because there's obviously a great need. I mean, we have many underserved neighborhoods when it comes to digital access. Um, but we also have a lot of existing infrastructure. So as you know, the previous um, hearing mentioned, you know, the City Watch camera system is, a, is an extensive footprint in the city. Um, what, when we build those, that, that system, we built extra spare fiber and spare resources into the, um, the systems that we can actually utilize for public Wi-Fi as well. So that is one of our priority um, areas is where can we, where can we do something fast um, and, uh, and without major construction? So that'll prioritize. Turns out that you know, city watch cameras are in many of the neighborhoods that are also targets for our, our efforts. Um, so in, uh, in addition to recreation centers, senior centers, and other obvious community spaces, parks are an obvious uh, space, and we, we will work with the communities and with rec and parks to ensure that we're doing it in a thoughtful and deliberate manner. And just as a, just as a follow-up, because you mentioned the community engagement plan, and that was something that was within your framework as well. Um, we can't get this work done without community engagement, without all partners on board within the city. What is the timeline for the completion of your engagement plan? And since the plan, since your equity framework plan was released, what has community engagement looked like for your agency or for, <laughs> for your agency? Very small agency, by the way. So it is a, a cast of thousands of, of lots of friends. And one of those is, is, is the OPI. And so um, they have completed their initial research. We are, they believe by the end of the summer they will have a complete plan. That does not mean that we are waiting in, in order to start. Our goal is to start, um, we, need a, we need an actual pilot um, in Gilmore Homes so that we can now engage residents in actually the system itself, in, in experiencing the log on, in experiencing, you know, the um, addressing their specific issues around privacy, security, safety, and that sort of thing. So it, it's really beneficial for us to have a live system to be able to, you know, take that next step, you know, essentially a beta. Um, and so our goal is to have the first hotspot start to go live in Gilmore by the middle of the summer latest, if not sooner. And then in, in as rapid succession as possible, given the challenges of the supply chain, and this is one of the kind of open um, questions, many of the key components of what we and BCIT and other agencies are finding are four to six months um, you know, lead times. So we are looking for alternate sources. But our overall plan for phase one of the ARPA um, spend, which is just the first six million, as the um, Chief Recovery Officer mentioned yesterday, our goal is to have the first 100 hotspots um, live within 12 months. So this time next year will be the first 100. That is our goal. And then um, our future plans, which is part of phase two, which has not been fully baked yet, um, and details are, are still being developed. but. Our ultimate goal is to have at least 400 hotspots throughout the city with ARPA funding. Uh, these are just the hotspots that, that ARPA um, dollars will be used for. Um, ultimate goal is to have hotspots throughout the city, free public Wi-Fi. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your questions. And just to quickly add to that um, community engagement piece that you mentioned, uh, Councilwoman, uh, to go along with the, I, you, I know you had mentioned the libraries and particularly Pratt Library and just kind of throwing out there that we know one of our neglected communities, Park Heights, 
is, be, is building the, their first new library for the entire city in 15 years. And um, there has been no real library service in a big, um, a, a huge area and hoping that that can, um, is, is included as you move. And that sits on, that will be on the campus of that C.C. Jackson Rec Center. So it's kind of a double um, effort. Uh, on that note, um, Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Director. I, uh, the service um, here doesn't have, it has money from the federal government and then money from the state. Um, how are you currently funded? So our funding is all ARPA dollars right now. My, my position for the first year was funded by uh, philanthropy through the Baltimore Civic Fund. Starting in March of this year, um, the entire office is funded by the ARPA dollars uh, that were discussed yesterday. And then for, so fiscal 23, you're going to be funded so partially through ARPA because of the, the allocation and then these other funding for specific. Yes, ma'am. The, the, the um, phase one that was announced previously was six million, which was, um, get my terminology correct, there's obligated or committed, um, 35 million committed, six million um, allocated, mm -hmm. I think is the right term. Um, and that's what we are defining as phase one for ARPA. So there's 29 million remaining that is yet to be um, publicly announced and we're developing, and this will go into a number of the other initiatives that we'll be rolling out over the coming months. Um, but what I've spoken to today is all funded by ARPA phase one. Mm -hmm. um, the other two sources of funding that show up in fiscal 23, I, I referenced one, that is the earmark. 2.3 million for, for senior centers and telehealth pilot. Um, and then there is a, a belief, a, a strong belief that we will also um, be successful in our application to the state's office, it's the Office of Statewide Broadband that has a $45 million municipal broadband fund that has been designated. However, they have not released guidance um, but we believe that we will uh, be successful in, in uh, applying for a portion of those funds. And it's my, my fervent hope that f at least five million of those we'll, we'll, we'll be able to receive and spend in this fiscal year. So this five million is not committed, but we're putting it in the budget to absorb it if it happens. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then, but the 2.3 million is in. It is, it, it requires a grant, um, the grant, so the, the con congressionally directed spending, i.e. the earmark, requires an agency to actually provide the, the funding, so it's been, um, it's been pre-approved. We have to submit a grant to um, HRSA, which is a yeah. division of HHS, HHS. Um, and we are in the process of completing that grant application now, and after that, it should be a relatively straightforward process. So the indicators that you have here are based on trying to get these two um, grants and then we, the indicators we've learned are not, don't include ARPA because that's a whole separate thing. The, the performance measures? Yeah. Yes, they are two of, I think, five that show up. I think for slides they show, it, the budget book may have all five. It does. So I, I selected the two that I think were probably the most um, resident facing and you know, one is is the number of residents that we're able to reach through our um, our digital skills training, training. Um, and then the, the second is recognizing that as we bring public Wi-Fi online, that sessions are a number of, of users. Um, you could think of as the the uh, number of users or activity, um, and so these targets are somewhat artificial because we don't have a basis to... Right, you're just, we don't even have right. a baseline. So. And honestly, they're probably a little bit sandbagged. I would expect a lot, lower, and a lot more usage if we're putting hotspots in the right places. Our goal is to put them, they are not intended, I should have highlighted this, public Wi-Fi is not an ex, a substitute for high quality, high speed internet in the home. It's, it's more what I would say is a, a public drinking fountain. It's for people who, you know, it's a convenience, if you can use the free Wi-Fi instead of using your prepaid data plan, it saves you money. If it is a 
back up if you don't have internet in the home or um, you know need to get online. But but our goal is to develop a very robust system that our residents trust, and that's a big part of why we're being so deliberate with our engagement strategy is to ensure we're addressing all those concerns up front. But and I think if we're successful in that, then these targets will be much higher next year. Thank you. And then the just to follow up to that, the Pratt Library also has a robust proposal. Um, they actually did a lot of work during the pandemic. Yes, ma'am. Because they really had to figure out a way to help people. They uh, supplied Wi-Fi for folks that were hanging out outside in the, in the uh, parking lot, but they also wanted to expand that to providing hotspots in the home, um, as well as just sort of amp up what they're doing. So are you partnering with that? Yes, ma'am, very okay. much so. So yeah. everything is sort of all, all connected. Yes. And yeah, I, I consider Pratt Libraries and the school system to be key partners in all of our, all the city's efforts in this. Like that is, is really, I would call the triad. Um, you know, we we have the uh, really the mandate, um, and so and, and to your point, Pratt Libraries has has not only done an incredible amount of work in this area, but they're the subject matter experts in many of this. And you know, the concept of a digital navigator sounds like a new term, but that's what libraries have been doing for a long time. For a long time, yes. right? Absolutely. And are we going to hear separately from the chief data officer, or how are we doing? This? Yes. Okay. But. Okay, well, I'll just yeah. wait then. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Councilwoman, just to add, I had another idea of a hot spot um, for, I guess, um, discussion with your team. Um, under the Office of Family and Children's Success are the Community Action Centers, and um, you know those are areas where people go to get help for a number of things, and I know that uh, they are going to be um, adding additional community action centers in our city too. So those are definitely great spots to, to think about. Array of information uh, residents go to at those centers. Yes, ma'am, excellent. Um, and next we're gonna to go to Council Member Conway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I really, I'm really happy to hear about the work that you're doing. I think it's incredibly important. Um, uh, one of the questions I had was regarding um, devices, uh, realizing that, of course, we can provide access to Wi-Fi, but without an adequate event, uh, device, that's an issue. Of course, we've got the training piece, but what about devices? Have we thought about that, and how are we tackling yes, sir. that? Excellent uh, question, uh, Councilman Conway. Um, devices are one of the three legs of the digital divide as we talk about. You have access, a device, and the skills necessary to use both. Um, devices also tend to be the easiest to solve in that it's a pretty dis distinct or discreet idea of getting a device. But that leaves out a lot of what really needs to happen. That is, um, how do we support those devices? Like how, you know, is there a, you know, the Best Buy Geek Squad for, you know, neighborhoods? Um, especially those who, who can't afford necessarily um, that that level of service at, you know at, at retail so there's two things that we are working on one is in conjunction with schools and libraries developing a citywide device strategy right which is in in, in between schools and the library uh, library system I think there's probably 30,000 or so uh, uh, give or take Chromebooks um, that are in circulation with, with students and families and then the library as well. And, and a number of those funds came through the, you know, the emergency connectivity fund, the E-rate funding that provided special funds for both laptops and hotspots. So the library actually checks these, these out, similar to books. Um, we also have an opportunity through the state uh, office I mentioned earlier, there's an additional $30 million fund that has been uh, is intended for devices. And what the director has told me is that um, the state will procure $30 million worth of Chromebooks. So I think that's roughly 150,000 devices. And then individual counties in the city will be able to request. So is our intent once those uh, that application opens that we will put in for a significant number, whatever our fair share is. and not only, not just acquiring devices, but as I said earlier, 
developing a robust support mechanism around that to ensure that we're, we're providing the level of training and like product support necessary. Yeah, and <clears throat> um, that, that, that's phenomenal. Um, I just um, had one other thing just to add to uh, Dr. Hardeback. Um, we are also looking to donate about 2,100 devices uh, from the city, whether that uh, one devices that are donated, but also devices that are used for um, or e-cycled devices through our network with PCs for people. Thank you. Uh, how can how can folks access that donation program that we're doing? I'm sorry. Say, say it again. How how do we uh, get folks access to that uh, donation it's, it's, program? We work with PCs for people. PCs and for, for instance, last summer they had a uh, an event where they gave devices uh, to residents. So it's it's something that's fairly uh, well publicized, uh, and they do that in conjunction with uh, uh, HABC. That's great. That's really really good to hear. Um, phenomenal work. I, I'm, I'm I'm really excited to, to hear that we're endeavoring upon this and thinking big. Um, the only other kind of note, um, and I'm sure we already have this in mind, we're always thinking about our returning citizens. Um, realizing there's uh, the training piece, there's the device piece, there's the access piece, they're, they're a significant part of this pie as well, not just our children, not just our elderly folks. So um, I encourage you as we think about the, the folks we want to be able to connect with, our, our returning citizens are going to be really, really important um, so that they don't fall back into whatever trap led them. Absolutely agree. Yeah. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from our data chief officer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Elsass, uh, chief data officer for the city. Um, you'll notice I don't have a separate budget slide. Um, I report directly to uh, CAO Shorter. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you have about the city's use of data, our Open Baltimore, um, Open Data Platform. Um, data governance and data science and analytics in, in the city. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm happy to, to um, you know, answer questions you have, highlight anything you're, you're interested in. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Councilwoman Ramos. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I didn't see anything in the book or anything, so you're under the mayoralty, I guess, under the CAO's office. Um, so are you, uh, you'll have to excuse me if I'm a little confused because it's been a crazy day and we still have more to go. Um, our, so your office is in charge of Open Baltimore as well as making sure that all of the agencies are providing data for whatever stat they participate in, is that right? Uh, to, to a degree. So um, there, there's a, uh, the, our GIS team over in BSIT um, kind of uh, manages the day-to-day -day function of Open Baltimore, our open data platform. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of provide a lot of the policy and, and direction on Open Baltimore itself. As far as stats go, that's usually a discussion between the Office of Performance and Innovation and the agency that they're, that they're, you know, they're statting or working with. To, so to OPI monitor. does that piece? Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the other things that you're working with, the Office of Broadband and other pieces? Are your, is your fu fun function purely just trying to make sure that there's data available when we ask for it or, you know, that when the public asks for it or making sure that our platforms are all taken care of? Give me a little bit more about, you know, what your role is going to be. Sure. Um, uh, what, one of my chief functions is around data governance. So some of the things that we've taken on over the last year, um, it was about a year ago when we, we started up kind of formal data governance in the city. Right. Um, a few of the things we've taken up, uh, we conducted, you know, you'll, if you talk to any chief data officer um, in any city, a lot of the, one of the fundamental tasks is usually conducting a data inventory, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's nothing, <laughs> nothing all that exciting. Um, we're I actually was the, in the, I'm the founding director of BNIA, so like right. we had to do the same thing. This was what 20 some odd years right. ago, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. So we've 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 done that work. Um, we're about to kind of publish at least a portion of it. Um, so we want to make that public so that that it's not just for our residents, but for our agencies to understand what each other are collecting. Um, we feel that that will aid in data discoverability. There are a lot of problems that are not owned by one agency. And a lot of the questions I get are around, do we collect this data or who has this data or hey, can this other agency share this data with me to solve X problem? 
Um, so we feel that that's a kind of a fundamental task um, that we, we feel every, a lot of folks will benefit from. Um, right now, on Open Baltimore, um, and by the way, this work is, is to a large degree conducted by data stewards in our agencies who are tasked with some of this work. It's an unfunded mandate to, to do some of this work. So they're carving out time each and every month to, to perform some of this work. Um, one of the, and I'm sure from your work as, as being a director, you, you probably understand this, this problem too, but one of the chief complaints we get on Open Ask, Baltimore yeah. mm -hmm. is our, um, is, is I don't understand what this data means. I don't understand what this field or value means. Can you provide some more information about the data? Right now our data stewards are going through an extensive metadata collection effort to provide residents with better information about where the data come from and what process generates that data so that people can better interpret it. Um, there are also a number of, of, of partnerships that are kind of in the works. So this is stepping maybe into the data science world as opposed to just strictly with data, data uh, governance. Um, one thing we're working on right now, and I, I think this is probably the first time we're kind of seeing it publicly, we are partnering with an organization called Data Science for Social Good mm. at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, you heard uh, in, in the earlier session um, from, from BSIT about the integration of CAD data, uh, of, our, of our vacant building notices with, with CAD data. Um, what we wanna do is actually take that one step further by using our rooftop imagery uh, to identify buildings that have rooftop collapse. This is something that our housing department has previously done manually. We're partnering with this organization who will develop an algorithm to detect rooftop collapse. And so every year when we get new aerial images of our rooftops, we'll be able to rerun this algorithm and find rooftops that have dam rooftop damage. Um, we're really excited to, to take on this effort. Um, we, we think it's an innovation use case. It'll be made the, the tool itself will be publicly available so that other cities can also adopt it. Um, we're not the only city that, that, that confronts this issue. Um, so those are a few examples of, of places where I've kind of either, you know, um, headed up data governance, kind of led some of those efforts, also connecting, you know, with external partners to get kind of more data science and analytics bandwidth, bandwidth for the city. But, but I'm happy to share share more um, if, if you'd like. Yeah, it's super exciting that, you know, as much data as we can give our firefighters ahead of time is super important. Um, and obviously, if there's a roof um, uh, compromised, there's likely other pieces, you know, floors in the building that are also compromised. Um, so that will give them a lot of, of great, great data. So thanks for, for working on that. That's going to be critical. Um, and we will be hearing from the fire department, so I'm sure we'll hear more about, they're gonna do a, a marking system uh, also, so when you approach, um, and uh, we'll see how that, how that also goes. So I, it's very exciting. Um, when we started BNIA, this was 20 years ago, I'm no longer there now, but this was a while ago, that data inventory was critical because then we figure out where the data was, well first we need to figure out what we were gonna measure, you know, and then what the data is gonna come from. At some point in time, hopefully, the work that you're doing is not only gonna be folding into sort of performance metrics that we're seeing here and working with the stats, but as we're doing outcome budgeting and actually having outcomes that we're focused on, that your work will also be about trying to figure out what that, those measures are gonna be and then how we measure it. So um, we had uh, in BNIA put together the vital signs. There, there's, there were 40 indicators then, there's like 110 now. <laughs> I think that's too many. But, um, but it was great in terms of making you know, policy decisions. Now we have like 20 years of this amazing data for these indicators and we can see so if we can start sort of start that process, and I've talked with the city administrator about this as, as well as the budget director, because um, you're already gathering all of the stuff that's being uh, measured and how we can use it, but I'd love to be able to get, at some point, have an exercise around, you know, here are the mayor's pillars, here's how we're, what we're achieving and how we're gonna measure it. Um, is more than just performance, right? Performance or the outputs um, will, be, will be great. So thank you very much for your work. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And before we go in recess, uh, the person behind you, is, is she part of your team? No, Did you? BMR. No, ma'am. <laughs> oh, okay. Can I introduce You're yourself? You're from finance. Yep. You're I'm from? Maggie Keene and BBMR. Okay. Because I saw you shaking your head. Just agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> we have to give so, them a um, Thanks for the support. Yeah. <laughs> we, 
One quick question, uh, Councilman Stokes, just, so we can have just, our 20 minute dinner. Just one, um, Madam Chair? Uh, yes. How many did Councilman O'Day have? <laughs> Come on, Councilman <laughs> Stokes. No, real quick, I, I wanted to, um, I know, you, um, I don't know if y'all actually, I'm um, kind of partnering with uh, PCs, but people who do, have done some great things in the city. Um, Mr. Gatewood, who's been really helpful, but um, they were very helpful in uh, Greenmount Rec Center, Cecil, I believe Ch I got about four rec centers that they were able to donate, you know, some um, refurbished um, laptops. And it really helped out because a lot of those young kids actually don't have access at home. So I just, I know y'all already know that, but I'm glad that you partner with them because a lot of times, you know, laptops are very expensive and when you get somebody to clean them up and, and refurbish them and you give access and it, it cuts back on that digital divide that we have in the city. So I just wanted to thank you guys for your leadership on that also. Thank you. We're in recess and 6 p.m. we will have the Department of Public Works. Thank you all again for the work you do and for joining us today.